Hello and welcome to The Quilling Quarter. I'm Charlotte. At the start of October 2020, I sat down with the incredible quilling artist, Leisha Politis. We talked about her process, we talked about where she gets her influences from, and we talked about a few of her pieces, and also an important and very influential invention that she stumbled upon. I really enjoyed my time talking with Leisha, and I hope you enjoy as well. Let's get the interview started. The amazing Leisha Politis, who has created all these amazing quilled creations over the years. Leisha, how are you? I'm oh, good, thanks. Shallow, it's nice of you to come and enjoy my quilling. Thanks. I think to start with, I'm most keen to know how did you get into quilling? Well, quilling, I came about it by accident from a local local newspaper where they had an ad that was featuring a lady who was teaching at her home in Gymea. It's Lady Jan Raz Borsik. I did about six lessons with her at her home and I really, really enjoyed them and, and it all sort of went from there. I saw that there was uh, quilling in the Easter show and I thought, oh, I'll give that a go. And I had another friend who used to come to the hall next door to me and teach and she was a quiller and she says, why don't you come and we'll do a bit of quilling and I was it just blossomed from there. That's really cool. And so had you done much paper craft before you came across quilling? None at all. Okay. None at all, really. I've done a lot of other things like embroidery, knitting and stitching, pressed flowers, lots of different things like that, but no, nothing really with paper at all. So when you discovered it, what sort of made you turn it into all this? Like what, what was it that drew you to quilling specifically? don't really know. I, I was impressed how easy it was to fringe a piece of paper and it would turn it into a flower. Quilling is really fantastic with flowers. It really blends itself so well to that type of thing, anything in nature. It's amazing how you can create this flat piece of paper, just do it, manipulate it a little bit, and then you've got a 3D piece. That impressed me. And I thought, oh, there's much more we can do with this. And really, we've got so much access to beautiful coloured papers. We throw so much of it away every day that we can really, it's not a complicated craft to get started. Just a bit of glue and a bit of paper and a bit of patience. And a lot of creativity. <laughs> <laughs> that comes with time. I think you look at things around you and you look at nature, you look at magazines, you see uh, what's around us. It's so much inspiration out there. It's in embroidery, in colours and dresses and all types of artwork can influence you and sort of inspire you. Mm. That's cool. That's re really interesting. So roughly when did you first run into quilling? What year was that? About 1996. Okay. Yes, it's sort of all grown since then. It's a slow process and all oh, those years slip away but and I've been entering the Easter show pretty well since 1997 every year I found that competition work really makes you strive to better your work just as a personal achievement being able to create something that is a little bit different and something that all amaze people I mean I get people say to me when I made the chess set in 2004 people at the Royal Easter Show would say, what is that made of? Is that wood or is that a cake? <laughs> no, it's purely paper. People are amazed at what can mm. be done with strips of paper. Yeah. So with this, had you seen a, a quilled chess set before or did you come up with this idea from scratch? I had seen a quilled set before in black and white. Okay. This piece I wanted to create with a theme. I started with the checkerboard which I went with the May Gibbs theme. Yeah. The game May Gibbs theme of the flannel flowers and the eucalypt gum leaves. And I thought I'd do all the icons in her characters. Mm. But really, to be able to make them, I had to be able to make them in paper. Mm. I sort of slightly diverted and became an Australiana theme. I kept with the green and gold of our national colours. Then I had to look at icons, and it's probably more a Sydney-related icons. Growing up here and being in Sydney, 
the tallest piece being the center point tower, the king, the harbour bridge being the queen, and of course the rook or the castle had to be the opera house. The bishop is the cockatoo there on the perch, and of course the knight had to be the jumping piece, was the kangaroo. <laughs> but you know, the kangaroo, when I made the fir first time I did the kangaroo, it looked like a bit like a rabbit. My youngest daughter said, it looks like a bit like a rabbit. Well, it does jump, but I didn't really intend it to be a rabbit. So I had to make it a little joey. That's awesome. Yeah, of course, the hardest piece of all were the echidnas, the rooks. I was looking for something that was small and insignificant, and I've had quite a process to come to that conclusion to do the echidnas, which I had things like jars of Vegemite and, and uh, the thong and different small incidental items. But the echidnas are quite effective in the end. Yeah, that would have been funny seeing a whole lot of flip flop thongs as the yes. board instead. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, and it was, you've got to think, you've got to be able to create this in paper. It doesn't always want to do what you want it to do. Mm. So. And how did, what about the um, actual checkerboard itself? How did you come up with the... Well, that's... Plate? That's from May Gibbs. Yes, yeah, so May Gibbs are supposed to represent the flannel flower. And they are wheat ears in the petals. And that's how the vortex coil was evolved. Oh, okay. From the, the petals of the, the flannel flower. So I should just point out here, Alicia actually coined and invented the vortex coil. So... I think it's a good point at this juncture to talk about the vortex coil. So it started when you're making this piece and then it sort of evolved from there or how did that come about? I had many of them on my workbench of the, the petals. I Because I what I tend to do is just make a whole lot and then I construct the actual mm. the piece that I'm working on the flower. And I had a lot of them and I was just playing around with them and I thought just I manipulated the, the shape and it when I pushed it down and let it go, oop, it made this like a vert vortex shape. Mm. Out of those pieces, I sent a design to the Guild to be submitted into their Quilling Quarterly magazine. Mm. And Jane Jenkins, who had noticed this different shape, she wrote to me and said to me, I'd like to name that shape the vortex call. Would you, do, would you mind? I think it's something new and something different. And I said, I'd be honoured that you you think that's worthy of uh, being recognised. Mm. It evolved from that, from the wheat ear, the leftover wheat ears <laughs> from the flannel flowers wow. of that of this of the checkerboard. So who would have thought, like in 1996, when you first discovered quilling, you'd actually be inventing like a really important technique? <laughs> that, sometimes that's what happens. I think things people stumble on them by chance, inventions and. Things happen, and I, this is purely one of those cases. Amazing. That's so cool. I'd be keen to know who you're inspired by or what inspires you to do all these amazing pieces, or if you want to speak about one in particular and where the inspiration came from. Inspiration comes from lots of areas. Like I say, I was inspired with this piece from a piece of Ukrainian folk art, mm. the part, the front of the balalaika. It was inspired by a piece of um, Ukrainian folk art and I tried to cre recreate the painted look. I don't know whether I really achieved it but I was sort of, uh, rather than make it uh, flat, I tried to create that, the shading within like it was painted. Mm. So I was looking for different things to try and see how, how they can be represented in paper. Mm. So many of these here pieces, there's different things that inspire me, just what's topical at the moment and what's current in that sense. This moment here, there were a lot of these type of cakes were very popular and my daughter had a party shop and she was involved in lots of that type of area and so I'd go out in jobs with her and there'd be not only her balloons on display, we would see the beautiful cakes that they were having for the event and oh, that must be, I'd like to do something like that. These, so I'll try and do it in paper and this part of the cake here mm. it was really tricky to try and find something to give that cut the cut look of the paper mm. where this type of shape wouldn't just didn't work mm. so I found just sort of in your everyday life things that we uh, come across 
is sort of inspires me. Like my sister with the succulent wreath, she um, collects succulents and she has the most amazing display, my sister Julda. And, and I, I'm amazed that when you look at these plants at her house and they were they were the most beautiful selections of greens mixed with a bit of purple and a bit of pink and and it was I was just like they must be able to make that in paper of mm. and succulents have been so popular I think during due to the drought mm. so it's sort of it's most of it's really just life experiences really mm. in sort of what's happening at the time that inspire me. Mm. But the inspiration can come from everywhere, like I think even just looking at embroidery, pictures of embroidery and uh, paintings and magazines, they all have some amazing photography and designs, colours. It's all, it's all just waiting there yeah. for us to see them. And I think also uh, you've had a big impact on making jewellery and you have a very distinct style. So including the piece that you're you're wearing. <laughs> um, did you want to talk about how you decided to start making all the jewellery and, and the style and how you're inspired by it? I suppose with jewellery, I while what I like about it, it is a practical piece and you can wear it. Mm. I know people I don't think it'll go in the washing machine, <laughs> but it will it's it you know, it will survive to a certain amount. And people will say, I can't believe that. That's paper. Can I feel it? And I'll say, yeah, certainly. You'll feel how, how strong it is. You know, one small sheet of paper it can be turned into something quite strong. It's, that's what amazes, amazes me too a lot of the time, how you can have this piece of paper mm. and it can't really crush that that easy. Where you've got a small strip of paper, how easy it is to, to manipulate it. But with jewellery, I found at least you know, you can wear it and people will say, really, is that paper? That's just, and, and if you mix it up with a bit of threads and colours, you can just change it and paper, it is uh, so easy to all look different. This is one from Anne's book. Oh, yes, yeah. The, uh, one of her designs that I interpreted her. She uses mostly metallic in her book, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't use any metallic and I just bandaged the ring coils <laughs> I'm just a maniac for bandaging <laughs> this is well that's a form of bandaging too so do you want to explain bandaging it can be just a single strip as in the balalaika a single strip of paper that is just you use the another strip and you just wind it around and around and around till you get to the end and then you just glue it off it's such a great quilling technique to define areas of quilling and give accentuation and and that's what I do like it in the um, the ring coil see of course I've using many strips of paper initially mm. before I've, I've bandaged it with the other color but it's bandaging is used in a lot in antique in the other things that they should do is tea caddies they mm. define areas with areas of uh, bandaged to put their designs in the different sections of the of, of the tea caddy. So Leisha, I'd like to sort of ask you, how would you describe your style? I think I'd probably call myself a traditional quiller. Okay. So when you say you're more of a traditionalist, like what, what's the traditionalist technique? Is that more like the actual shapes? Or yes, what, what do yes, you mean? that's more of these actual, there's approximately nine different quilling techniques in the traditional style that the guild have in their handbook mm -hmm. and which you have to be proficient at when you become accredited. A lot of the new more on edge style is a lot more relaxed. It's not so many tight closed loose rolls mm -hmm. and a lot of the traditional techniques. It's a lot more open, it's usually done with cardboard to allow it to be stand up firmly where paper doesn't stand well to on edge work. I'm just trying to think like how people are using cardboard for quilling rather than paper. That's really interesting. <laughs> it's still a paper yeah, technically <laughs> but it has a memory. Cardboard has a memory that paper if you get a crease in a piece of paper you can just run it through your fingers 
and you can take the memory out. Where card, once you've creased it, it you usually can't uncrease it. It's got a memory. It's a little bit more trickier too, card working with card. A lot of card, depending on the the quality of the card, the cardboard will split and you and that detracts from the work as well. Having that, that split look in the edge, on the on edge, which doesn't happen with a, a ordinary paper. Yeah, it's, a, it's quite a bit to learn in that side, putting, putting together a design and then be able to complete the the article without showing too much glue mm. because you only got that single line of card that's making the line and Yulia is so <laughs> good at it. She's a master of that. Yeah, she's very inspiring. Uh, unbelievable. Yeah. It's fantastic. I love her work. It's great to see she's inspiring all all out there. Yeah. There's so many, so many great designs. She does so many great portraits. I know that's probably inspired a lot of this new style. Mm -hmm. But she does use the, the traditional techniques in her quite a few traditional techniques in her work. And she does call it quilling too, so yeah. It's good to see it being acknowledged. I would be really keen to know, like if we take say the cake, like can you walk us through the process from conception and then designing it and putting it all together and then the finished product? Like what are the steps involved? Yes, as many months of planning goes <laughs> and I think with all, most of my pieces of work, at least half the time spent doing the piece is in the preparation, while I call R&D, research and development. <laughs> There's the different parts, there's the base, the cake, and the stand. And of course, there was the, the other part was the number. So those parts, you've got to work out one at a time, all those type of things. So well, the main thing was the cake. So I had to work on the actual cake first, come up with what works best with that. And I went with the hundreds and thousands that we call here in Australia. I'm not sure that's, it's uh, everywhere called. Sprinkles. <laughs> yeah, or sprinkles they're called, but that's, we tend to call them hundreds and thousands and there were thousands of pieces <laughs> rolled on those colors the actual cake is hollow mm. so I had to construct a rigid cardboard cake and and I glued my quilling to the actual cardboard structure that sat on the plate and then I made a base and I created different levels of, of shapes that sat over that mm. to create the stand, which is a technically still just this type of just using more paper and just bigger bigger pieces of paper. Mm. So you just create that textural and the, uh, the shape of the stand. Mm. Then the stand then has to sit on a board, which I created to try to make a doily, a doily effect there. Most of the work of quilling can be very repetitive and that's what it is. It's just a making a combination of a series of shapes that fitted to make the, like the doily effect. And creating the number was what sort of thing to put on the number. Again, it was a lot of trial and error, but it still came back to the hundreds and thousands. There's so many different things you could do. You could, I really did not want to use any flowers. I want it to be a flower free piece. <laughs> Quilling is so, lends itself so well to flowers. It is such a great thing and it's, a lot of my pieces do have flowers in them. Mm. The piece with the spoon mm. and just a slice of cake. So just to... And so can you describe some of the techniques that you use just for this slice of cake? The tight rolls, they're called on the outside. Mm -hmm. the, on this one, this is spiral technique. You wind it around a piece of metal like a rigid florist wire mm -hmm. and just allow it to spring off and glue it down one by one. Then there's a bit of crimping just between the layers to look at the icing. Again I've used crimping to look at the base of the cake. The spoon has got the tight coils which are dimensional. So that's where they, yeah, they pop up pop a little up, bit. Yeah. And again the spoon is also a tight coil which is dimensional and I push, push it down. So cool. It's a very a very useful technique that it becomes like a tight curl and, and and then you can manipulate it to whatever shape you want. I used that technique a hell of a lot in the wreath. Mm. 
the succulent had to sit up. I learned a lot with that piece. <laughs> because normally flowers, they sit down, and they're more flatter, mm. this flatter type thing that we use a lot. More flatter type was used in traditional quilling. Mm. This is flatter shape. But with the succulents, they come up, they rise up to you. Yeah. Many of those pieces in there, they were flatter and they just didn't look right. And I had to reconstruct it and glued the actual petals in a more upright position. Right. <laughs> but I was just, I'm just amazed how different they looked. So with this succulent wreath, roughly how many hours would you have spent in the design process and then in the actual construction process? It's about equal. I find that whatever, however long it takes from beginning to the actual ex exhibition was probably six months. Wow. So there's a hell of a lot of time. Three months of it is trial and error and I have lots of pieces just sitting there and I'm, and it's very challenging, really. <laughs> <laughs> and a very challenging process, that research and development. Sometimes I even dream a bit of quilling and it's amazing how good it is to walk the dog. Sometimes I need to clear my head and it's amazing how just going for a walk, you think, oh, there, that's what I can do. Oh, that's what I need. Yeah, that's where I'm going wrong. It's, <laughs> it's just amazing is how, how, how something will come to you. Mm or a publication, a quilling magazine, or even a, just a commercial magazine, you're going, that's what I need to do. That's what, I'm, well, what it needs. There's quite a bit of uh, planning goes into, into these pieces. You know, there's the different layers involved. And, and really with the wreath, I had to work on the actual pieces that sat on the wreath first before I did the wreath. I had it on a bit of paper, I had it drawn out the size of the wreath I wanted and I would put the flowers down there on flat and I thought so I have enough flowers now, maybe I should make the wreath. Once I've made the wreath, I've got to try and get the flowers to stay on this three-dimensional piece of wreath. It was okay, they stayed on the, the paper, no problem, and they sat there, but when you go and then you realise, oh, those few flowers are not going to be enough to go around that. I need some more, more succulents. <laughs> I have to create a whole lot more succulents to cover the wreath that was that's curved now. So oh. from one thing leads <laughs> to another, and you go all these steps in the design. Yeah, when you create a piece, it's, it's you think, oh, that's all it is, but then you really come down to glue it down. It just doesn't do what you want it to do, or it doesn't go the way your mind was thinking. Oh man, that is amazing. And so I think I remember reading that this uh, succulent wreath, this one, this was displayed in the Royal Easter Show last year in 2019? Yes, it was in the Standard of Excellence Showcase. It was selected to go in to that. Most of the first prizes are selected to go in the Standard of Excellence Showcase. Mm. And from that showcase is one selected to, to be awarded the Francis Binney Award. The Francis Binney Award is is given to the most meritorious exhibit in that showcase for that year. Wow. And I was over the moon to win it. Congratulations. <laughs> Us quillers have been dreaming of that time that we would take that prize out. It's the most beautiful pieces that have won in the past, you know, the leather work, embroidery, and the quilts, mm -hmm. and the knitting. And us knitters who have been dreaming of this, it was such an honour for, uh, for us quillers, such an honour for me, such an honour for us quillers, and nothing of any type of paperwork had taken that prize out previously. Oh, wow. So it was, we were, were over the moon that quilling has become recognised. And from that, they used that picture of my... That's amazing. ..of, the, of, the, of my uh, wreath on their schedule for the following year and it was all on the website pictures of it so it well, i did see it as a great honor and that they had the recognizing quilling as sort of becoming much a little bit more popular that's you're definitely a giant in the quilling world <laughs> oh there's a, there's a lot of really great quillers out there but i'm just one of them yeah but, uh, we all sort of help each other and learn and share our our ideas mm. and, and it's great. 
another thing I've read about your amazing work is that you have entered into the Royal Easter Show every year since 1997 and you've won every year basically since 2009. Is that right? Yes, I can't remember the exact <laughs> dates, but I'm initially, I know in the early days, I was always highly commended, highly commended. I thought, oh, I'm stuck on this highly commended. <laughs> But I did go up to third, and then I went to second, and then I did get a first in 2003. Oh, yes, 2003. 2003. Oh, cool. And then 2004, I did my chess set, and that went in the standard of excellence. And that was mind blowing for me, too. Yes, I've had quite a few uh, entries in the standard of excellence since then. It was just too amazing. I had to remember the T set, it was on a revolving carousel oh cool yes it was for the whole duration of the show it was the tea set was on a revolving uh carousel within that showcase of excellence and i think this one might have been two so that so uh, it was nice to have it move it was moving so it is a very big honor for me that's cool. very, very big honor tell us about this one when did you do this and and yeah, when did, how did it all go when you're designing it? Well, this piece here, a bit of a, a mix. I, the fruit is all in the bright colours and then the actual bowl is in more the neutral colours that you'll see in a lot of the antique quilling you'll see in places like the Victoria Albert Museum mm. in England. Mm. They, they've got, whether the paper was that originally that colour or whether I'm really, do not know for sure, or whether that's the, that's they didn't have access to too much colour paper, mm. but that's what the actual the bowl is more inspired by that type of thing that you'll see on the the tea caddies. Mm. I try to use with my techniques um, with my pieces to use a, a variety of techniques across so that you sort of showing your skill. Mm. I did include the vortex coil in this piece, the pineapple. And I just created slightly, but if you can see from one side, you'll see an orange centre and the other side, a green oh, yeah. centre. It sort of create that textural sort of shape of the pineapple, even though everything is really not so sculptural. It's trying to marry those type of things, that flat 2D, mm. and create the picture that looks, looks or authentic in the sense of the grapes are more sculptural but the pear is flat and it's, yeah. it's sort of making it marry it together there so but I was very happy with the way the pineapple turned out in that piece yeah sort of and used my um, vortex coil technique there so, so you made this in 2006 but it won all the awards in 2007 yes it went to, yes went to the echo and that's right it was it was uh, it did go to America and Martha Stewart was featured on the Martha Stewart program. What's the Martha Stewart program? She does a lot of craft show. I don't know if she's running still in America anymore as, as a television program. Yes, no, that was, <laughs> I couldn't believe it actually. Somebody from America had called me to say that we're going to feature on the Martha Stewart program. Very cool. It did actually feature at the Museum of Brisbane after the ECA. Remember they came by courier to pick it up to take it there. A series of different exhibits that, they had from the 2007 ECA, oh, cool. which was the Queensland show. Yeah, cool. Um, and then so the it's travelled a bit. <laughs> it's travelled a bit. So tell us about this piece. Yes, the mannequin. She was probably one of my earliest uh, 3D pieces. It incorporates a little bit of everything, and a paper necklace, probably my first foray into paper jewellery which then included a pair of earrings and a brooch and it's got crimping. And a ring? Yes, and a ring. <laughs> <laughs> and of course a, a little bag that was supposed to put, put the brooch inside. But it's got, like, I like, I do like repetitive designs and designs that tessellate. Mm. And this is what I've done with a few of my boards. I tessellate the shapes to create a design. I think it's pretty well tessellated, all this is tessellated, many hours of rolling <laughs> and lots of flowers mixed with tight coils. Mm. And of course you use these here would 
use a different tool to make this cylinder shape to those tight coils there. So. Mm. And it was, it travelled also, I think, to off to England. <laughs> and I think it was awarded, it was awarded the Masters in England. So it's been to England and back. <laughs> and so when you said you used the different tools, can you show us the tools that yes. you use for each piece? I have still got my original tool I learnt with Jan Rasbull. She had a business called Quick Quill. Paper goes in the metal slot mm. and then you just create a cylinder. And so that's what you'd use for yes. these ones? Yes, certainly. Where I make a, my own tool mostly is just through a perm rod mm. and I put a hot needle and I push it with a pair of pliers into the perm rod and that's got a very fine oh. needle. Wow. To create a very fine needle centre, centre as fine as possible. And so that tool is what you used for each yes, of these ones? Yes. Yes. Wow. Of course in England they they roll by hand and they don't even, they their claim to fame is that all their tight coils don't show any centre hole at all. <laughs> but I, I, I found rolling by hand quite difficult even though a lot of quilling techniques you do use your hands without mm. a tool but I find actually making a tight coil without a tool difficult myself. Right. <laughs> so what's this piece called and when did you make this one? This is Alice in Paperland, a bit of a whimsical piece and of course I wanted something for the teapot I like the heart sort of feeling. Oops. And so I covered a foam ball for the body of the teapot, mm. but I wanted it to be able to be interact so you could see inside. That's cool. Well, of course, in this piece I've used also quite, I like to use a series of uh, techniques, quilling techniques. Mm. I've, I've used the bandage again to give it defined areas. It's a great technique. Mm. And those little, cupcakes are adorable. <laughs> <laughs> They're bit, that's the whimsical too. Little, pop a little teapot there, and just, just something a little bit mad to have this tea party. <laughs> it's so cool. And so this was in two thousand and ten. Twenty ten. Yes. And I think if I'm right, it won first place in the Royal Easter Show, and it won the People's Choice Award in the North American Quilling Guild. Also won the Rose Bowl. UK Quilling Guild yes. Prize. So this yes, is a very well awarded mm. piece. Yes. This is incredible. And travelled again. And too. Travel. Yes. It has travelled to America and England. Wow. Wait. And to the Sydney Royal Easter Show. I think it's beautiful. I love the colours. It's, you like it? It's fantastic. Yeah, it's a bit of a fun, fun piece. Yeah. Fun piece, bright and colourful. What's the name of this piece? This is called Day of the Races and features a life-size pair of shoes with the red bottom on it. I don't know if they'll fit anybody, but uh, they're more or less supposed to be life-size. Again, I've tessellated the board to create a pattern with uh, cylinders and to offset the, the quilling features part of the day of the races. You need always need your handbag, <laughs> so it's all paper. And I've created the long spills. They're called spills, or a quilling technique. They create the outside of the bag and then I've put some tiny little daisies mm. with metallic edging on the uh, randomly around the bag. Of course, we can't go to the races without a fascinator. That is amazing. <laughs> so, I think you could probably actually use it. I'm not big on fascinators myself, but it could be used. So we went with a purple, white and black theme with mm. a bit of highlights with metallic and this 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 design. I really love the silver, like the, how it shines in when you look at it. Yes. It catches your eye. Mm, it's fantastic. Off, it is great. There's so many beautiful papers out there. Lots of new metallic edge papers that are it's just amazing with just what you can do with a bit of colour. Yeah. So this one got first place in the Royal Easter Show. It was in the Standard of Excellence, yes. It was at this point that you became a fellow of the English Quilling Guild? I think it was 2010, yes. There's about a dozen fellows worldwide. Wow. Yes, yeah, so uh, I was very honoured to be awarded that fellowship. So what's this piece called and when did you make this piece? This is the babushkas that um, 
I've all got an individual Russian name <laughs> and I've created the actual bodies from a plasticine mould which then I made a paper mache shape and they've all got their name inside their bodies. That's Anastasia. <laughs> Again, I've used the bandaging quite a lot in this piece around the border edge and on in their uh, their aprons and their in their dresses. So mm -hmm. they're all got and they just slop back together. That's but each one of them have their own colour scheme, but still they've got the purple features in each mm -hmm. in all of them. And again, I've made the checkerboard for the base mm -hmm. in a, a gold. So you mentioned this one was Anastasia. What are the other ones' names? <laughs> I've got to remember here. Ludmila, lovely Russian name, Sletvana, Kristina, and Lydia. <laughs> and a little baby. <laughs> yeah, and a baby. I don't know what her name was. but That's fantastic. I really put their faces, I painted, it was a challenge, the face. Mm -hmm. Painted their faces with um, a coloured pencil. But it's not easy to draw on a piece of quill paper, tight oh. coil. Oh, so that's actually a coil, that's a that's coil, a, the that's face. A, a tight coil. Wow. I don't know if you, when you ever try to paint something that's like that, you'll get the ridges mm. as you go through the layers. Yeah. I had to come up with an idea and I covered it with a few layers of glue. Mm. So it's created a film so it was more smooth. Yes. To be able to then create the features on the face without making... Is going through the ridges in the paper. Gotcha. So that very, very, uh, several coats. Some of them look a bit more sadder than others. <laughs> and so this was this one won uh, first place in, at the Royal Easter Show again? Yes, it was in the Standard of Excellence as well. So what's this oh, one called? Oh, yeah, she's a um, paper bird cage with um, one little yellow birdie <laughs> sitting on the on her swing there. And I tried to create like the empty bird cage, but then I wanted the flowers. It's got massive lot of flowers, this piece. Yeah. A bit tricky in the construction. I had to do the flowers first and then I built the cage up around it. And of course I used the bandaging again in this piece. And I've repeated some of the flowers from the actual base in the top above the hang and just below the hanger. So I've used a bit of vortex coils in this one as well, sitting in here. And again, I tried to use a varying techniques in all these pieces. So even like the structure is paper isn't it? Like you yes, haven't it made is. it around anything? No, that, it's all completely paper. It's about 10, each one of those vertical parts of the the bird cage are about 10 strips of paper bandaged with an, just a single piece of white paper. Amazing that it holds its shape like that. Yeah, so it cool. is amazing how strong paper can be when you do many layers. And, and that bird is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> his bird cage. It's a bit tricky bird to uh, construct and then trickier to make sure she didn't want to fall off the, off the <laughs> perch. So you mentioned this one went to the UK and back? Yes, it certainly did. And what, what did it go Travel to the UK the for? It was awarded the Masters in 2015 in, in England. At their, the, wow. uh, the annual competition that they have in England. Came back to Australia, the bird was still on its perch. <laughs> Tell us about this piece. What's it called? When, when did you make it? It's a ballad like it. It was a tribute to Angelo's father. It was He was a musician. He played most musical instruments. I don't think ever a ballad like it. <laughs> That's the already. But the design that I went with on this piece was inspired by a piece of Ukraine folk art. Mm. So I've tried to create that painted look in the bird's wings and their bodies and in the flowers and tried to give it that like Russian influence and the berries and the autumn sort of tones in the uh, flowers and the foliage. Then I used a lot of bandaging to create the fine areas in the balalaika at the back. We've got those segments in the instrument. It's not authentically this authentic size wise there's two different balalaikas. There's a small version and a a bigger version, but the, the small version has three uh, strings in mm. it. So I went with that. It's a slightly shorter. For the Easter show, you must come with inside size restrictions. Right. So I had to keep within the size restrictions for that so it didn't make it authentic size. 
but I was pleased with the outcome. The frets here and then made the little little tiny little roses there that go up and down the balalaika there. That's amazing. And this, you entered this into the Royal Easter Show? Yes, well, yeah. yes I did. It was uh, in the standard of excellence as well. Amazing. Yes. Amazing. <laughs> it is a very special piece and I was pleased with the outcome. I, I sometimes just can't believe it that I I get to the other other side of the piece. It mm. really is just just amazes me. Because like, it takes so long. Yes, so. and there's, there's the steps that happen. It's not only the the actual structure that the piece of quilling is on, like in the cake or even the wreath, not only the structure that it's on, mm. but then there's the different elements and areas of the piece that need to have to be completed mm. and to be able not only to to do the front, there's the, the main part with the strings and then the back. You can see why the design process takes so yes, long. Yes, it is. It, it, it is. And it's sort of nice to get to the other side. Yeah. Yeah. This boat just keeps sailing along. <laughs> so what's this piece? A really different piece again. <laughs> I, it was a massive challenge and trying to get motifs that on the flag to sort of work and to create that billowing like as if the wind is in that sails. Uh, yes, it was a massive challenge and uh, kept to that colour scheme of the red, white and blue. And to add things that are a little bit nautical in there, sort of with the anchor compass at the front and all the anchors and the flags it's and the ladders to go up the, up the top. But I've used oh, yeah. a lot, again, a lot of crimping, a lot of bandaging in this mm. piece. I love the name as well. How'd you come up with the name? Yes, I know. There's a lot of debate around here about <laughs> what the name should have been. It's, um, yes, it is Sequil. So that also got first place at the Royal Easter Show. Yes, it was in the Standard of Excellence. So it's a bit of a combination shape. Mm. I don't think you'll find a boat that looks like quite like that. <laughs> but anyhow, it's a paper one. And again, it's a construction of the boat and then having to put your quilling on that structure is a massive challenge and then like keeping the sails and make keeping them in the right place and do they look balanced and so forth. The last one that I have as a piece I'd like to ask you about is the succulent wreath which we have chatted about. Yes. Um, but I think so that that one's the one that won the Francis Binney, mm. Francis Binney Award? Francis Binney Award. And you mentioned that that was the first time that Quillers had ever been awarded. <laughs> yes, it was awarded. The it was a massive honour for uh, for me and I am for the Quillers mm. uh, to, that Quilling had taken that prize out. In all the years of the that award, it had been awarded to many other beautiful pieces like the leather work of the saddlery. Then there was beautiful quilts and and tablecloths and crocheting mm. and on and on and on and. We're, well, us quillers were always waiting for that day for a, <laughs> for a piece of quilling to be awarded the Francis Binney, which is given to the most meritorious piece in the standard of excellence. So mm. it was a massive honour that uh, the quilling took that prize out. Mm. So we've talked about all the pieces that you've made over the last 25 years or so. What piece are you working on now? We have got a, uh, a group feature display earmarked for this year's Easter show, mm. which was involved the quillers, lace making, the tatters, and the folk art people. They were a combined ex uh, group feature. I had to the job of making a series of cockatoos <laughs> larger than life. Mm. Actually, they wanted the bigger the better. I was given the instructions to feature in this display, which was to be a feature around the actual. Um, the four different sides. It's a 10 by 10 metres area. And they need to be bigger, the cockatoos, for people to actually get the the idea of what's happening within the display. So hopefully 2021, that this feature display will continue. Mm -hmm. I've made a series of different cockatoos. They're still a work in progress where they have different styles. Some are more paper sculpture and some have got this on edge this mm. more modern, on-edge style. That's 
what I have been working on. So hopefully we'll, for next Easter, they'll be completed. And are they going to have names? Easter? Well, that's, <laughs> I think we probably will need to give them some, I'll just give them some names. Some of them just don't want to do what I want to do. They look, that beak <laughs> wants to bite me. I say, stay up there on that perch. <laughs> what can you do? It keeps wanting to move around. But uh, let's uh, hopefully it all goes well next year so mm. we can continue with the display. Yeah, cool. And a few final questions to finish off. Um, what is your favourite quilling tool? I don't really necessarily have a favourite, but I, because I use a series of tools between a needle tool or the metal tool. Well, the other quilling tool is your actual fingers. Mm. Because we do for alternative side loopings, and ring coils, your fingers do a wonderful job. So you don't need a tool at all. The metal tool is very handy, uh, the metal slotted tool for a cylinder, but I suppose I do use my needle, my handmade needle tool, which is just an ordinary tapestry needle pushed into a perm rod. It has a very fine needle for the paper to, to slot into. Mm. So I probably is, it coming down, it is my favourite probably that. And you made it yourself. Yes, and I, when I'm doing, working on a piece, I make about 10 of these. Oh, you they, make them for each piece? Well, I usually do. I make a whole series. And what happens to them, the needles do break. So I've got to remake them again. So I just, rather than having to stop and start during a piece that I'm working on, I have, I'm, Angela helps me make these tools and with his heat gun, and I pushed it in there, surprisingly, they go quite easily, mm. the, the heated needle, into that end of that perm rod, and it stays in there quite securely. What breaks is the end of the needle, the, the piece of the needle on the end there breaks off because too much rough rolling. Right. <laughs> it's been like after yeah. the thousandth piece since <laughs> it's tired. It. Maybe that's it too. <laughs> maybe that's what the problem was, maybe. Yeah, so I make quite a few of them, and then the Bob so I don't have to keep running back and forward. So I have mm. to have them ready on hand. And what is your favourite quilling technique? Oh, quilling techniques. There's so many good ones too. But, you know, I'd have to say uh, probably the vortex coil. <laughs> I'm a bias there. <laughs> but then there's, uh, I love the ring coils. Mm. I use that a lot in my jewellery. Bandaging. Bandaging is fantastic. Bandaging, I've... So much of it I've used in, 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 my, in my competition pieces. It's a simple technique, but very, very handy. Mm. And what's your ideal GSM in your paper? I get about 120 grams for paper. Okay. But the card, if you're doing on-edge work, it has to be at least 200 GSM. Mm -hmm. Do you cut your own strips or do you buy ready-made? All my quilling paper, 99% of it is I purchase it from Cardcraft, Zoe. She does it all by mail order. Mm. She does some beautiful quality paper. Her paper is fantastic. Mm. It's got a great texture to it. And that's the, I, I've bought her paper as well, and that, that's what I made the earrings. They're yeah, very, very effective, <laughs> Charlotte. They're very nice. Congratulations, that's, well done. I, I like buying from Zoe as well. She yeah, she's, she has a really good uh, system going there. You mentioned you are involved with uh, the Sydney Quillers. Yes. Tell us about the group. The Sydney Quillers uh, group has been going around about 25 years. I'm not a founding member, but I've been involved about 20 years with Sydney Quillers now. We're a group of like-minded people, male and female, young and old, and we welcome everybody. We meet uh, four times a year, every three months. We try to have at least two demos each meeting. It's, it's a nice light-hearted day and we have about 70 members and, and hopefully with COVID well, things will get back to mm. a bit of normality out there. People feel confident to be able to travel mm. and come and be part of the group again. So it's been good. It's been and we'd love to see well, you younger, <laughs> younger people come into the group and, and, and be part of it. Yeah, and so I think the next meeting sometime in November, is that right? November the 8th, yes. November the 8th. So make sure you come join us here in Sydney, come <laughs> to the Sydney Quillers. <laughs> That'd be lovely. That'd be lovely. We're, we're, you're most welcome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Alicia. It's been really, really cool seeing your amazing work and all the work you've done over the last 20 plus years, the, the Vortex coil that you invented, mm. all the prizes that you've won, 
how you've influenced and, and shaped quilling. It's, it's been really good. I've personally been inspired by your work quite a lot and it's been fantastic speaking with you. Thank you yeah, so it was, much. It was all my pleasure, uh, Charlotte, and I'm so pleased when I hear somebody who uh, is inspired by my work and it takes the interest in knowing, learning about it. That makes, my, makes it all worthwhile, being able to, that somebody takes the interest. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much and thank you for your time. You're very welcome. <laughs>